Good morning from the um, East Coast of North America. I'm just joining you now, caught the uh, tail end of the last session, which sounded really, really great. So I hope you all have enjoyed the start of the second day of um, this year's conference. It's my pleasure once again to facilitate uh, the posters and um, we, we will all be pleased to know that there is no video component today for me to mess up. So as normal, um, our process is going to be um, four minutes each for each poster. We will do four posters and then three and then four. Um, I will share my screen so that you can see the order of presenters. Uh, da, da, da. There we go. Um, so we will go uh, Tasha, Ursula, Rebecca, Ruth, and then we will take a break before we do the next batch. So um, Tasha, if you are ready, I will start your timer. Thank you, Jen. And hi, everybody. I am here today to give you a very quick whip through of that is not my poster. Uh, a very quick whip through of CANTA, which is the code of practice for usage metrics. Now, we've been around for 20 years. For the Wait, wait, Tasha, wait, wait. It's not fair for you to talk while um, I'm screwing around with the slides. There, there we are. are. Okay, please start again. Okay. <laughs> I hope that doesn't count, come out of my four minutes. As I said, counter is the industry standard for usage metrics. We've been around for 20 years and we've acknowledged and worked with open access for a decade now. Release 5, which came out in 2019, was much better at working with open access, but Release 5.1, which was published this year for compliance in January of 2025, really has been optimized for open access. And the reason that we have done that is that we are very well aware from working with our members and, and the wider community that usage is really important, not just for measuring return on investment in subscription content, which is, I acknowledge, where we were born, but it's important for measuring impact. It is one of a suite of measures of impact. And I always say all metrics should be handled with care. It is not a substitute for human judgment. The reason that Counter was born is that web analytics, even back in 2003, were opaque commercial products that nobody really understood it was not possible for libraries or publishers to see what was happening over time and be convinced and, and confident that things were comparable, that their usage metrics were, were valid. So we pulled together a community of libraries, of publishers, of technology providers, of consortia to really define a community created standard for measuring usage that could be trusted by everybody to be a valid way that would give you comparable results over all the different data types, over all the different platforms and over time. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a rundown of 5.1 and why it's so good for open access. The first is that we have sorted out some of our technical difficulties that made item level reporting, that very granular reporting of articles or book chapters or specific data sets difficult. So those discrepancies have gone. It's now very easy to report at this very granular level, including a much smaller report delivery mechanism in the form of an open API 3.1 compliant JSON schema. We did three things within the code of practice itself to really optimize it for open access. One is that shift to item, that, that tiny granular item being the unit of reporting. It's the most important piece. We are much less focused on title, so that's journal or book level reporting, than we am, than we are on the, the individual items. We also clarified our access types, so we no longer specify OA gold, it just is open. Whatever flavor of open access you are working with, you're good to go. 
there is still controlled for those of you running hybrid titles and of course free to read if something is temporarily free. The third thing that we really boosted the profile of is what we call the global reports. So we know that for open access, usage by a specific institution is much less relevant than the total usage worldwide. So we've really emphasized that we want that worldwide usage in the open access reports. Taken together, those three things allow us to really put the focus on the global item report. So that is worldwide usage on an item by item level across the board. And finally, we've really looked into our compliance because we know that audits were difficult for open access only publishers, and we have developed ways to deliver OA only audits and to allow those who cannot afford a full audit process inclusion in the counter registry, which is how libraries know that you're doing decent reports by providing proof that you can pass the validation tool. So that is technical compliance only. I think I'm on time and I'm going to hand over to the next speaker. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tasha. So this is Ursula and I hope it's the right poster. Ursula, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And yes, it is the right poster. Um, as said, my name is Ursula. I'm the project community manager for the Palmera project. Um, and with this poster, I wish to share with you how is this project collaborating with two others, Diamas and Craftaway. With over 40 project partners all together across the three projects, these European Union funded efforts are working towards an equitable future for scholarly communication with academic communities at the center. Each project has its respective area of focus. So CraftOA that stands for creating a robust accessible federated technology for open access has as its aim the creation of a technical toolkit for Diamond Open Access Journals. DIAMAS, that stands for Developing Institutional Open Access Publishing Models to Advance Scholarly Communication, intends to provide quality standards for institutional publishing. And finally, Palomera, that stands for Policy Alignment of Open Access Monographs in the European Research Area, will deliver resources as well as recommendations for the adoption of open access books, sorry, open access book policies. Despite their separate focus areas, their efforts walk towards a broad and common vision for a more open and equitable scholarly publishing ecosystem. You might be asking how will their outputs achieve that? By providing services and tools, CraftOA is empowering regional journal platforms and publishing service providers to upscale, professionalize, and reach stronger interoperability with other scientific information systems. The Diamas project is developing common standards, guidance, and practices to build capacity for the diamond publishing sector. Formulating recommendation of this kind aims to create a more sustainable future for open access diamond publishing in Europe. Finally, Palomera has set out to provide actionable recommendations and concrete resources to support and coordinate aligned funder and institutional policies for open access books. Doing so involves assessing challenges and bottlenecks that currently slow down the widespread implementation of open access book policies. Indeed, all three projects need to understand the challenges and bottlenecks of what they are trying to achieve. Additionally, they have similar structures where they all start with the analysis of the landscape or data collection in order to conduct their work and prepare the project outputs. This phase is very much rooted in the community feedback and input. Such activities of involving the community are not only linked to this phase, they, are, they will indeed be present throughout the projects. To give you an example, uh, Palomero is currently collecting the data on open access book policies with surveys, online interviews and other discussion forums to be able to analyze it and prepare reliable recommendations and resources, which will then be again validated by the community. The three projects are also working hard on collaborating in the organization of presentations like this one, as well as joint webinars. We already had one in 2023, um, and the next one is scheduled to happen in 2024. If you are interested in knowing more, signing up for events or mailing list, you can visit each of the project website by scanning the QR code on the poster 
And I know that the poster is also linked in the OASPA conference program or by visiting the website, which I will also post in the chat. Additionally, you can also contact me directly and I will share my email address shortly. And I think that's it for me. Super, thank you so much, Ursula. Rebecca, you are up next. Hi everyone, um, just to let you know, I won't be sharing my screen. I have a horrible cold and no one needs to see that. So, um, hi, I'm Rebecca Wojtowska. I'm currently the University of Edinburgh's Open Access Publishing Officer. So in 2018, the University of Edinburgh submitted a proposal to create a shared service between multiple institutions from all around Scotland. And that service would be dedicated to open hosting. It would be governed by SCURL, uh, but provided by the University of Edinburgh. So SCURL stands for the Scottish Confederation of University and Research Libraries. It is a membership body that supports service development and improvement, and key areas of work are coordination, collaboration and advocacy. The aim of the service was to equip member institutions with a hosting solution to fulfil their open access publishing activities, with the development time charged back to the University of Edinburgh. Uh, the fees that we charge, they only serve to cover the cost, and that's mainly technical costs, staffing costs. Everything is invested back into the service. It's currently at £1,400 plus VAT per year. The service launched with three members and we now have 10, which is awesome, and we have more on the way. All members meet three times a year to discuss the shape and direction of the service and um, it really is a partnership. It's, it's not just led by Edinburgh, which is really, really great. So what does the service offer? Scale partners get their own installation of open source software, whether that's open journal systems or open monograph press, and we complete the initial configuration and customization. Both OGS and OMP can be used either to manage the full publishing workflow, including submission management and peer review, or just for publishing online, and we provide guidance and training on using these systems. We also provide the ongoing technical support, so uh, migrations, upgrades, and general day-to-day -day maintenance. We also provide guidance in all areas of publishing, and that includes things like archiving and preservation, copyright and permissions, um, gathering metrics, creating reports, policy development, identifying and submitting to uh, indexing databases, um, publication ethics, and, and so much more that I don't have time to go into. Um, the service doesn't include uh, ISSNs, ISBNs, and DOI uh, distribution. Partners arrange these themselves. And although we provide guidance around submitting to indexing databases and on reporting, we don't actually do the submissions or gather the metrics ourselves. Um, we also don't provide copy editing or typesetting services. It's purely down to lack of resource and it is something that we're looking into. Um, there are many benefits to a shared service, especially for open access content. Uh, for example, it offers many flexible hosting and publishing solutions. Um, we can set up hosting services for other libraries, like we're doing for St Andrews, for example. We can set up publishing arms for membership groups, like we have done for the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, and they actually came to us from Cambridge University Press. Uh, and we can also set up traditional presses like we have for Scottish Universities Press, which is a really exciting new press. Do check them out. Um, the regular meetings and team channel means that we can pool knowledge. Um, it's impossible to know everything yourself, as we all know. Um, and the more people there are, the more ideas can be thrown into the mix. Um, and also a lot of these initiatives are run literally by one or two people, if that. So getting together feels like having a bigger team and having uh, more colleagues to bounce ideas off. Also, there is a greater opportunity for innovation. More people means more ideas and input, and the more of us there are, the stronger the service is. Um, we can also share those ideas to wider communities, which is great. So, of course, there are challenges. The reason people use the service is to outsource resource they don't have. So it means all that resource is coming from one place. So you need to ensure you grow sustainably. We've just hired a full time tech person to help, and I'm very excited about that. There are, of course, some financial barriers, but we try to keep our prices down. And although having more people means more ideas, it could mean more conflict, but it hasn't ever happened in our experience because um, we just have one or two representatives and we respect each other. So overall, two big thumbs up from us. Please reach out if you have further questions. Apology for my cold nasally presentation and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs> Rebecca, thank you. Thanks for joining us, even though you're not feeling well. All right, to close out this batch, we have Ruth. Hi, thanks. And great to hear from you, Rebecca. I'll definitely be in touch because um, the project that I'd like to introduce to you, Publish OA, today is um, 
quite similar in ideas um, at an earlier stage. So we're one year into a two year project carrying out a feasibility study to investigate the creation of a national Diamond OA publishing platform for Ireland. And that would be from end to end, from peer review to the reader reading the, the book or the journal or whatever it is that is put online. So Publish OA is co-led by the Royal Irish Academy and Trinity College Dublin. And we have 10 partners um, who are institutions, the Trade Association for Publishers and a variety of other people who are working on the project. And we also have advisory affiliates such as the DOAJ and our Irish Humanities Alliance who have been a fantastic source for us. The funding for this has come from the Irish government and was approved by the National Open Research Forum at the end of 2022. And the project will run until November next year. I am a publisher of books and journals here at the Royal Irish Academy. I run the publishing house. And like many publishers in Ireland, we operate on a small team and have tiny resources and the world of open access and meeting all those needs is, is a, 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 a complicated aspect to our job. Um, as part of this project, we've had to assess and map the publishing landscape, first of all. So we've created a directory of Irish publishers um, on the island of Ireland. And we've published that open access on our website. I hope it might be of use to some of you people, um, listing all the book publishers and journal publishers. Publishers, authors, and readers are all our stakeholders, and we want to engage these with these communities to understand what they need before recommending a national platform. So as you can see, we've done a survey, and we're about to deep into the dive into the qualitative aspect of that to understand the financial needs any lack of knowledge the publishers feel they have, where they might need help in terms of copyright or rights or um, assigning orchids and um, I, I, any of those aspects that they don't understand to provide them with a publisher support program, um, as well as the technical aspect of which platform should we use and how should we build it. We're also going to publish a comparison of the technical specs of many of those platforms, which again, we hope will be a benefit to some of you um, who might like to use that. And there are some webinars as well from the different organizations like OMP and uh, Janeway and those. And so that if you are looking at using a platform, you can um, use the work that we've done so far. So the public, the project, as I said, is funded by the Irish government. And we've been careful to link in with international partners and initiatives such as Dianus and Palamera and other national platforms such as the Finnish, the Dutch and the French, who've all been a great support to us. We know we're not alone in this project, um, but it's for us to recommend the best solution for Ireland. And um, so as you can see there, we're assessing the landscape. We've published our directory. We're in the middle of the survey and we're dram drafting a landscape report. We have a support program for publishers. So if there are any Irish publishers watching, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're going to pilot some of these platforms now to determine what the community's needs are when they're trying to publish journals and books and what particular things they'd like to be in any platform that we might build. And then the final thing that we are producing are is our guides for authors and for publishers who may come to publish OA once a year or every so often. And this guide will just give them a quick checklist for that, for all of the things that they need to do to meet the requirements of funders. Um, I'd like to invite anybody who's interested to get in touch. Our contact details are there on the website. Or if you just want to use some of the tools that we're developing, please um, grab them from the website as well. Thank you all very much. And I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thanks so much, Ruth. Okay. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions now. Um, please use the Q&A box to pose any questions you have um, for the first four posters. Um, Ruby, thanks. Um, you flagged this question for me um, for Tasha. Um, and Tasha, um, the question is, uh, if you could speak to any GDPR implications in relation to counter. So counter is privacy protective by design. We do not include any non-aggregated information in any counter report. The lowest level of granularity that it would ever go to would be institution-wide usage. So for example, everything from the University of Edinburgh aggregated into a single report covering a whole month. So you will never see individual information in a counter report. We also uh, require that 
counter compliant providers do not share counter reports if they are institution specific they can only go to that institution or to the consortium that has supported that institution so it can't go to anywhere else the university of edinburgh's reports cannot go to the university of oxford as an example uh, and similarly, the consortium reports, so JISC's reports, cannot go to anyone else either. So JISC reports cannot go to, to an individual member of that consortium unless JISC sends it out. So we really do try to be as privacy protective as possible. And there are quite a lot of um, bits of detail in the code of practice itself. Super. Thanks very much, Tasha. Uh... Okay, um, Ruth, um, really appreciate those messages um, about collaboration, engaging with um, the other countries with experience. So, so thanks, thanks for saying that, thanks for doing that. Question for you um, from the audience is, um, if you could uh, describe any complications you've run into in mapping the current landscape. Well, um, complications technically are simply the, um, the, the differences in needs between book publishers and journal publishers and the different yeah anything that comes to mind yeah so th that literally they have different experiences and different needs and so we have some people who are entirely ready to jump in with the OA and we have other people who have never done it before and would like to learn about it and would like to learn a little bit more about it so we've had to tailor we we're running webinars and um in-person meetings. So we have to tailor the information that we're delivering to the different needs of different people. So that's one of the challenges. And the other is that our platform will probably have to, we'll probably have to have two different platforms, one for books and one for journals. Um, I'm gonna ask a question of Rebecca, um, and, but Ruth, you're getting some more. So if you don't mind um, helping yourself to the Q&A and, and answering them, I'd appreciate that. Um, Rebecca, I wanted to just explore a little bit the technical support um, that you guys have um, for, for your project. I know you said that you just engaged a, a full-time technical person, but could you just describe what type of support has been required to install and maintain um, the publishing platforms for your project? Yeah, of course. So. Um... The service previously, as I said, had three members. And when I joined in 2020, I was asked to grow the service. At that time, we had one day a week of tech support and it got to the point where they were like, all right, stop growing it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the, the proper answer was not to stop growing it, but to get more tech support. So that's why we brought on that additional um, person who starts next week, excitingly. Um, but I think the biggest challenge has definitely been that resource because um, so many partners just don't have it and i think i'm the only full person who works full time on their service as if we're talking about library publishing um the other partners across scotland have other jobs and they run their publishing programs as part of their wider jobs so um it does mean there is a lot of reliance on um, my publishing knowledge i have a academic publishing background um not a library one as well as our tech support so um, that has been the challenge, but as I said, we're trying to grow sustainably. We've now got someone full time. I now have a full time team member, which is lovely. Um, and yeah, I think we're just going to see more growth um, here on out. So great. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, I'd like to ask you and, and others, you know, keep talking, please keep talking about your experience and, and share it with the rest of us um, so, that, so that we can learn. Um, in preparing for the opening session on um, open infrastructure, one of the, the solutions that was raised for supporting the adoption of open infrastructure was resourcing, you know, dedicating more developer time. So I'm curious to know where, where we're gonna find that, how we're gonna fund that in the community. But we need to move to um, some more posters. So so um, we're going to do three posters now. Um, so we have uh, Lucia, Lauren, and Toby. Um, and if I if I mispronounce your name, please uh, do correct me when you take over. Uh, let's cross your fingers and your toes while I share my screen. Aha. Okay. So uh, Lucia, you should be good to go. Okay. Thank you. Um... Thanks for inviting me to present today. So as my post suggests, I'm going to be talking to you about the Open Access Journals Toolkit and explain how it aims to broaden participation across open access publishing. Um, so to get started, I'd like to explain what the OA Journals Toolkit is. So the toolkit is essentially a website and you can find this at oajournals-toolkit.org. 
Um, and this website brings together information on a range of different topics for members of the OA community that would like to start or manage open access journals. So the various different pages on the Toolkit website provide information on topics all across the journal development lifecycle. So this starts from creating an open access journal, considers things like finding funding, staffing considerations, policies, and also some of the more technical aspects involved as well. Now, the organisations that created and funded the toolkit were OASPA and the Directory of Open Access Journals, the DOAJ, and Research Consulting, where I'm from. We also supported the coordination of the toolkit write-up, but we were very aware that all of our organisations were based in European nations with uh, similar, similar perspectives and experiences, whereas the open access community more generally is extremely diverse. So we were really keen to um, ensure that the resource we were creating was actually going to be relevant for all of those different users and that it would represent different perspectives, different publisher sizes, languages, et cetera. So to do this, we set up um, an editorial board that had 12 international experts, one of which Rebecca has already presented on this call. Um, and all of these experts um, had expertise across different aspects of the journal development lifecycle and helped us to write up all of the content that you'll see on the website. They also peer reviewed each other's content to ensure that the articles on policies, for example, weren't just relevant to UK users. Um, they might be relevant to people accessing the toolkit from other country, countries as well. So taking that a little bit further, we also thought that um, the scholarly record isn't just in English. We need to appreciate the diversity of all the other different languages as well. So that's why we launched the toolkit in um, English and French. And we're also planning to translate the toolkit into other languages in the future, such as Arabic. And taking that further again, we also recognise that people wouldn't just um, access our resource from high income countries with reliable internet connections. So we also work with web developers to ensure that our documents could be downloaded in PDF format offline, for example. So I think that while all of these things are very nice intentions and we have tried as hard as we can to create um, a resource that will support a diverse community, it's al always quite nice to see how these resources are received by the communities that they're designed to support as well. So I think the response has generally been quite positive from just anecdotal experience that I've heard from people. But we can also see that while the toolkit is quite young, so it was launched in July earlier this year, we've had almost 8,000 visitors to the website and we can see that these visitors come from over 100 different countries and they represent every continent in the world, apart from Antarctica, as far as I can tell, but it's a pretty good range. Um, so I think the point to end on is that while this toolkit is still very young, it does already seem to be supporting a global range of users and journals and libraries, for example, can also use it as a training resource for uh, people looking to set up journals as well. So it has a broad range of uses and hopefully it will continue to do that over time. That's it from me. Thank you. Lucia, thank you. Lauren, you are up next. Thanks, Jen. Uh, my name is Lauren Cadwalder. I'm from the uh, non-profit publisher PLOS. Uh, our poster is using our open science indicators data set to look at regional adoption of open science practices. The open science indicators data set takes uh, articles published by PLOS as well as uh, comparators and looks at the different uh, practices um, related to open science and whether the articles are practicing them or not. So it looks at uh, data and code, both in terms of whether it's being generated and if it's being shared, and then adds details about where it's being shared. And it also looks at whether preprints are being posted. The poster uses version three of the data set. So that's articles published between uh, the 1st of January, 2019 to the end of March, 2023. And there are about 74,000 plus articles in that collection. There are about, uh, I think about 8,000 comparator articles, but the poster is just concentrating on the PLOS articles because we have the best metadata for those. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the data set, it is openly available and version four should be released uh, next week. So the poster is really kind of looking at how trends uh, change over time from 2019 to 2023, and also how they vary between the different geographical regions. 
What we do see is that generally open science practices increase over time. And so we're looking at data shared in a repository here because PLOS has a mandatory data sharing uh, policy already. So we're thinking about best practice in terms of data. So we see an increase there. We see generally an increase in preprints being posted. There is a little bit more variability in the data. Not everyone's increasing. Some of that, uh, I suspect, is due to kind of a smaller sample size in some of those regions. But we also see the amount of code being shared increased over, over time. And the graph showing the amount of code shared is uh, taken out of articles that are generating code. So it gives a, a kind of a good indication of uh, how much code is being shared and how much could be shared. We see differences between the various regions, uh, mostly with Americas, Europe and Australasia having higher rates of open science adoption. And we see lower rates elsewhere. And this is really useful for us as publishers. It helps us think about what support that we can provide for different communities, and make sure that we can tailor that support for them. So we might think about different languages in the different regions and trying to get away from that bias towards English language, open science kind of explanations or educational tools and really think about how we can provide infrastructure or support or guidance that really works for the communities and the, the, the issues that they find and kind of make sure that we're promoting open science adoption in a way that kind of meets them where they already are and not have like too high expectations or not high enough expectations for what we might be able to achieve. Uh, so that's the poster. I would happily talk about open science indicators with day if anyone has any questions i'll be happy to answer them and i'll put some links into the chat with uh, the link to the data set if anyone is interested in using it and we always welcome community feedback on the data set we really want to make sure it's useful for other people as well so i'd love to hear what you will think thank you thanks lauren and that gives us a few seconds back uh but Toby will close out this batch. So Toby, please go ahead. Thank you much, Jen. And uh, also thanks so much for the invitation to present on Toast today. Um, let me start by taking a closer look at what Toast does. In an uphill, Toast is a metadata creation, management, and dissemination platform specifically tailored to tackle the problems of getting open access work into the book supply chain. Uh, the platform provides publishers with an online platform to gather all of the metadata needed to disseminate books, such as information on titles, uh, authors, publication data, and the like, as well as metadata specific to digital and open access books, including persisted identifiers or outputs, links to files, and contributors and their institutional affiliation. Uh, those uh, data model is granular enough that publishers can add metadata on chapters within books. It can be used to store abstracts as well as citations, and it can include information on multiple reader-facing outlets where a book can be found. Um, Toth enables the wide dissemination of these records by transforming them into a variety of industry standard and distributor-specific metadata formats and exposing all records openly under a CC0 license via open APIs. Uh, the initial idea for Toad emerged out of the shared experience of a number of scholarly presses who, after facing the significant challenges of starting up publishing programs, came to realize that their next major challenge was to get their books into the scholarly record and more widely discoverable. Um, as many of you will know, the established supply chain for scholarly books is difficult to access for new publishers and not designed to handle open access books. Most smaller new publishers lack access to the specialized title management systems used by bigger publishers. And even those expensive systems are not uh, oriented to open access books. Bigger publishers are also better able to navigate the supply chain because they have ded dedicated staff, such as metadata specialists and marketing managers who focus entirely on distribution. Toast their hopes to level the playing, uh, playing field between large and smaller publishers by alleviating some of the difficulties faced by those smaller presses. Toth approaches these problems by making it easier for publishers to create and manage metadata for their titles. It eases the substantial burden of submitting records to multiple distributors. With Toth, publishers need to create a metadata record only once. Using the platform or Toth's open API, data can then be exported in the many forms and formats required by the intermediary platform. Several publishers have now adopted Toth as their metadata manager to create, manage, and distribute metadata in multiple formats, 
including platform-specific flavors of Onyx, Mark, JSON, and KBARD. That fulfill requirements, for example, of OAPEN, the director of Open Access Book, Kotlin Muse, JSTOR, Google Books, and the like. Um, TOTH also enables them to submit book and chapter level metadata to Crossref for DUI registration and to archive content in all university repositories and the Internet Archive via the TOTH archiving network a prototype. Book details and entire catalogs can also be directly integrated in the third party application uh, with third party applications via TOTH's open APIs. This is currently already being done by the Open Book Collective the scholarly consortium and open book publishers, all of whom utilize TOTH's open APIs as a trusted and open source of book metadata to create novel content and services. And under the remit of uh, the Open Book Futures project grant, uh, TOTH is working with a variety of community-led stakeholders, including Koki, the Public Knowledge Project and Cielo Books to establish trusted connections between a number of open systems, such as Open Monograph Press, Science Open this Book Meta Hub, and Koki's book analytics dashboard. But all in all, TOTH re reduces the amount of insider knowledge needed to, to, to strategically navigate the scholarly book supply chain. The TOTH team is putting in the legwork of making organizational and technical connections with di distributors so that smaller publishers don't have to. Thanks so much. Toby, perfect timing. Thank you. Okay, we are going to um, take a short break for questions before we go to our last um, four publisher, sorry, posters. Um, so I'm looking at the Q&A and the first question is for, for Lauren um, and how you um, might act on the, on the data. What do you do with this? Uh, yeah, well, I guess there are two parts to this question. First of all, we're always trying to continually improve that data. So we're looking at it, we're checking that it's how we think it is we're talking to data here who we're working with on the data to kind of improve the algorithm and next week we should be releasing some uh, protocols data as a, as a new indicator but as a, as a journal we take the data and it's, it's really useful actually for just benchmarking where we are so we um, have various initiatives that we have been trying and now we can actually really measure and see if there's any impact so for example, we've integrated preprint servers with some of our journals, and now we can really get a, a good uh, and regular kind of update to the data about and help us see if they're working. And we can also think about different editorial interventions that we might want to trial. So before we had all of this data at PLOS Biology, the editors were encouraging people who were sharing stuff on GitHub to use Zenodo. Uh, and now we have that data, we can actually see that that's making a difference in terms of where people who publish in PLOS Biology are sharing their, their outputs. And so actually now we can start thinking about other editorial interventions and which journals they might be more suitable to uh, that we might want to trial. Uh, and then I guess the last thing that I'm doing at the moment uh, to mention is that we're thinking about code policies on other journals. So now we can look at the voluntary rates of code sharing across journals and think about which communities might be receptive to a stronger policy. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Toby, I'd like to ask you a question um, before we go back to, to Rebecca from the first batch. Um, Toby, you said um, you just mentioned how, you know, um, some of the larger, um, often commercial book publishers have more marketing resource. And I was wondering, um, you may have touched on this, but if you could just remind us, are you aware of any collaborative efforts amongst the open access book publishers to coordinate on, on outreach and marketing? Um... And that's a good question. Uh, there are a couple of initiatives uh, I am aware of. For example, the Open Book Collective, which is uh, not targeted really at uh, larger public publishers, but really uh, small and uh, um, university publishers um, who are coordinating and collaborating on, on yeah, exactly that, on uh, uh, joining uh, outreach efforts, for example, for uh, providing a forum uh, for uh, knowledge exchange, but also for sharing practices with regard, for example, of how individual publishers are uh, approaching this kind of uh, larger um, as, uh, ecosystem of getting books into the scholarly uh, record, because it is quite a vast and uh, uh, expansive uh, yeah, um, network of systems, really, um, that like especially the small publishers have. Um, yeah. Quite a lot of problems of uh, getting to uh, groups with, uh, especially in the when when starting up a new press, 
And um, this is also where, uh, yeah, I think Toth comes into the mix because we are collaborating on the Open Book Collective as well with all of those publishers. Um, but uh, yeah, since you asked about uh, like maybe other initiatives as well, I understand there in, in the US, for example, there is uh, the Big Ten Alliance, which is also similarly, I understand, joining uh, efforts of uh, um, you know, working together on these kinds of questions. Uh, likewise, uh, from um, uh, colleagues who have presented here on the Scottish University Press uh, um, and the collaborative efforts there, or the Irish ones. So um, there's a uh, lot of different uh, new initiatives, exciting initiatives that that uh, important to uh, keep in mind to be on the look, lookout for because yeah, these uh, needs really pop up on a variety of different. Uh, in the variety of different regions uh, and um, areas. Uh, so I think it is quite an overarching uh, topic indeed. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll come back to our other questions that are at our next question break. I, I appreciate that reply um, because, um, you know, I'm with a, a small open source nonprofit project myself now and, and there I'm looking for opportunities where we can create scale together where we can work together on outreach and whilst we focus on our on the things that we have to do that are core for organization so um, i'm learning a lot today thank you um, okay let's go to our um, next batch of presenters we have four um, and ross thank you for that link as well um, so we're going to close out with um, alessio and then um, kieran uh, alicia and then yvonne so wish me luck with my exercise Mwaha. All right, um, Alessio, will you please start yeah. your four minutes now? Yeah, thanks Jennifer and thanks to the organizers for the, um, for the invitation. I'm Alessio, I'm uh, head of um, journal development and eLife, uh, and I'm happy to tell you a bit quickly about the new publishing uh, model that we launched at the, at the end of January this year. I apologize actually for some of the writings that looked a bit more in order in my, in my screen when I shared the poster, but it's it's clear enough. Um, so the, the top part of the poster shows the, the a diagram that I will guide you through quickly uh, about the new model. The first step is submission. And at this stage, we consider only preprints. Uh, following this, uh, we decide which preprints we review and which not. This is a decision that is taken by the editorial board at eLife, uh, a group of about 800 scientists active in their fields. And um, normally a paper at this stage is seen by three or more experts uh, before uh, we decide to if to review or not. I also want to stress that the decision to review is not meant uh, to be a, a judgment of the quality of the research because the quality of the research is something we'll tell uh, in the public reviews and public assessment if we decide to review. The decision to review is rather uh, a reflection of whether we have the expertise to, to handle that uh, paper and whether the editors think that adding the public review and assessment to that preprint will be broadly useful. Following this, uh, we publish everything we review. There is no rejection uh, after um, review. We publish uh, everything as a review preprint, which includes the preprint, the public reviews, and the public assessment, which is a few sentences summary uh, of the significance and solidity of the research written by the editors and reviewers together. The peer review is consultative again, where reviewers and editors um, uh, get together to agree on their uh, feedback to the authors, and authors have the chance to correct factual errors in the public reviews and the, the public assessment before we publish them. After this, we publish the review preprint, which uh, is citable with a DOI. And at this stage, we are in the light green uh, in the diagram. It's the authors who decide what they want to do. They can take the review preprint and publish it in another journal. Uh, they can call that reviewed preprint version one or following versions of a review preprint, a, a version of record, BOR, which is akin a traditional journal article, which cannot be published in other journals, or they can revise the, according to the recommendations from the reviewers, uh, at which point we'll consider the revisions and we'll update the, the public review and the, and the public assessment accordingly. What I want to stress is that the idea of this model is to really shift uh, the research uh, and science assessment from assessing based on where the research is published, the journal where it's published, uh, to what is actually published. And, and the idea is that we give information about what is published 
uh, in the in the public reviews and the, and the, and the public assessment. At the bottom of the poster, you see some preliminary results. Uh, preliminary because the model was launched end of January, so. Bottom left in light green, you see uh, an increasing trend in, in submissions into the new model. And we have very few authors who are still picking up uh, and submitting into the traditional model, which we are keeping alive for the time being. In the middle, you see the fraction of papers we send out for review. And this is about on average 30%, which is similar if we compare traditional or old model with the new model and also similar to um, historic data, 2022, you see here before we launch the new model. And at the bottom right, you see the top 10 countries from which we receive submissions. And I'm not showing here the historic data from 2022, but the trend I can tell you is, uh, is the same comparing again uh, before and after the new model. I put some um, uh, bullet points uh, in the conclusions and perspectives of on what I've just told you. Uh, I want to acknowledgement as well. Uh, I want to thank people uh, at the life, uh, the entire editorial board, and our uh, our funders. And thank you for uh, for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alessio. We're going to move to Kieran next. Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Kieran. I'm from the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, and I'm talking about a case study on our transition to open access um, across three regions and focusing on the impact that transformative agreements have had in this. Um, so in 2020, we launched our RMP um, offering uh, uncapped automatic OA to institutions. And here we've grouped countries based on the level of uptake of those agreements. Um, so starting off with region one, this is the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, these were the only countries where we had national consortium deals in place which allowed us to pitch our offer very simply to all member institutions. And uptake was high from the start. Uh, by 2023, we have 53 institutions signed up. And as a result, the proportion of articles published OA went from around 40% in 2019 to 87% in 2022. So that was a, a big success for us. Um, moving on to region two, this is the USA and Canada. Uh, which were two countries where we didn't have engagement at the national um, consortium level or anything like that at the start. Um, and so we had to negotiate with institutions individually and we did that with moderate success. Um, we did manage to get a small number of institutions on board and the ones that did, did it significantly increase their OA output. Um, but the overall effect in these countries was quite limited. Um, and then moving on lastly to region three, um, this is China, which for us uh, is quite a unique region in terms of OA publishing. Um, no transformative agreements in place here, although in 2019, at the start of our um, analysis period, we actually had most of our publications here um, being published OA, but it was through um, APCs and mostly in a single journal um, called Bioscience Reports. Um, and then over the following four years, uh, various things happened um, for us in China. And we had an issue with paper mills um, bioscience reports took a big hit to its author base. Um, and as a result of which the number of OA publications uh, steadily declined. And that was yeah the only major region where, where we've seen this trend. Um, and while we don't think transforming agreements would necessarily have, have stopped this, we think it could have helped um, curb this decline uh, by growing publications in, in other journals rather than them just being focused in, in one APC journal as, as they were. Um, but yeah, more details on, on that situation in China and, and also the other two regions can be found in, in a case study, um, which we've done, and the link is below at the bottom of the poster. Um, but in summary, we think um, the study just emphasizes some, some key points, which probably won't be surprising, but are just nicely um, highlighted by, by, by this study. Um, and these are that RMP has provided real benefits and value for institutions, um, particularly in the UK, where um, so far this year, we, we virtually have no um, APC um, APCs coming in. Almost everything is going um, OA via RMP um, and Australia and New Zealand as well. Um, it's looking good for us and, and consortia have been uh, really key in getting institutions on board with us in these regions because um, we're a small publisher. Um, and yeah, also that RMP is only effective where there is adequate funding and existing research output, of course. Um, and then in other regions where this isn't the case, that um, alternative models are needed to complement um, RMP. 
And that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Alicia, you are next. Hi. So, yeah, first of all, I will start with the ambitions of the uh, European Commission when to create an open access platform. And they said they wanted to allow their beneficiaries from Horizon funding programs to publish their research at no cost to them, as the cost is covered centrally by the European Commission. So we follow a post-publication open peer review model. So that means that we decouple the publication from the passing of peer review and indexation. The articles are published with a CCBI license and the underlying and supporting data is deposited in approved repositories. During the last uh, two years that we have been live, we have published over 430 articles with 84% of those have completed peer review and 57 of those have passed peer review. In terms of the article types that we have published, so we offer 14 different um, article types. Um, half of our content is uh, the traditional research articles followed by method articles, but we also see examples of these um, less traditional um, outputs such as the software tool articles or um, data notes. And then we have as the top five countries by author affiliation, we have Italy, Germany, UK, Spain and France. In terms of the publication per subject area, th three quarters of our content correspond to social sciences, uh, engineering and technology, and natural sciences. During these over two years, we have achieved index indexation in Scopus, PubMed, Ariplus, and many others. We have also launched 36 community gateways and 100 collections, which provide dedicated subject-specific hubs. It's also important to know that we have partnered with, um, we have worked with our partners who are Eurodoc, who represent the P European PhD candidates, uh, Lever, the European Association of Librarians, the Global Yan Academy and Open Air, to promote the platform and encourage the uptake of open research practices in the community. As our next steps, uh, of course, we want to increase the indexation in relevant venues, and we will also expand the authorship eligibility criteria to other European Commission funded uh, researchers, and um, we are also going to implement a multilingual multilingual article metadata that includes the abstract, and we offer the authors the opportunity to submit their abstract in an addition, additional language different from English. We are also working in implementing the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for metadata harvesting to increase the operability of the platform and its content. And finally, we are aware that of the importance of creating a sustainable and scalable strategy for the platform to support the long-term vision of a pan-European platform that the European Commission has and that will start in 2026. That's it. Thank you. Nice. Thanks, Alicia. All right, Ivana. I'm restarting the timer. Is it Yvonne, Ivana? Ruby, is she here? Jen, I'm just checking. I don't think that Yvonne is here. So thank you. you. The next poster and we'll see if one comes back in. Um, this is the last poster, uh, but we can take a question. Ah, oh, she's here now. Here there, Ruby. Sorry. Oh, is. Yvonne is here now. Yeah. Yes, there we go. <laughs> okay, okay, great. <laughs> thank you. Four minutes, your go. <laughs> And thank you very much, everybody. Um, apologies um, that you, I'm hoping people can see me. Um, so this afternoon, um, I wanted to talk particularly about a rubric for open access infrastructure funding that we developed here at the University of Warwick. There's been a lot of talk this after, uh, for the last couple of days around how to use library funds and how we're all grappling with the decision-making process when there are a lot of demands on limited resources. This is one of the tools we've developed to help that situation. 
The problem we were trying to solve was that we have a growing number of requests for both open access agreements and infrastructure projects looking for limited funding. But we only had a static funding pot from which to make these decisions. We wanted more consistency and more importantly, more transparency in our decision making so we could look back over the years and see what we'd funded and exactly why. We've also been dealing with an issue of a single point of failure, or more precisely, a single point of institutional experience, meaning the decisions were all having to go through a single person. We needed a way to allow staff with less experience in this area to make the decisions. So in an aim to move towards a more information driven decision making process, we developed a rubric, rubric of the five different dimensions highlighted here, cost, people, support, benefits and drawbacks that offers and agreements could be scored against in a simple and straightforward way, most often using the information provided in the JISC offer documents. This way we could build a record of the agreements that had been scored and whether we funded them or not, and this way we could make comparisons and thus decisions clear and transparent in case we had any queries about why we funded this, this agreement or that one. As part of the development in the scoring guidance for each dimension, we used a number of existing pieces of work to support ours. The Fair Open Access Alliance's Fair Open Access Principles, the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, or SCOS, as well as the work already published by Kiyu Laven the fund for, and their fund for fair open access. All of these influenced and fed into the main text of our rubric. So did it work? Short answer, as with many things, is yes and no. As you can see from the examples given, we did manage to use the rubric to compare agreements quite successfully. You can see the, uh, the uh, rubric in use for DOAJ, Archive and the Public Knowledge Project here. But it's still not a perfect system. As we found, the devil is always in the detail. There are still areas in the agreements, agreement offers that are not clear for staff to look at and see what's going on or how to score them. Some of the issues we're looking to score on, such as the benefits um, of the particular agreement, remain quite complex. But leaving out these dimensions reduced, that we found, reduced the usefulness of the rubric. We also found that there were a number of outliers that broke the system. We found that when we were looking at, um, at certain dimensions, particularly around the number of people um, uh, that a particular agreement supported, we found that uh, there were still some things that scored quite badly on the rubric that we still wanted to fund. So moving forward, we're going to maintain a referral process when we're likely to refuse funding. This will hopefully stop the outliers from getting missed and allow them to continue to be funded while we work on the rubric further. We also want to include more detail into the examples given in the main text of the rubric, as it's clear that, every, that as everything scores badly on drawbacks, we need to approach that dimension differently. While we have proved that the rubric works and can be a useful tool in funding decision making process, we've only used it over the last six months. We're at the point now where we need to revise and resubmit and taking into account the issues we've found so that we can hopefully get it closer to being a tool that will allow anyone in the library or across the institution to use it and predict where we might be putting our funding. Thank you. Yvonne, thank you. All right. Excellent work team, a really, really great um, presentation. So a huge, huge span of, of material we're talking about today. Um, I'm gonna stop us there. Um, we've got lots and lots of questions um, in the Q&A and, um, and Ruby's gonna uh, uh, allow the panelists to keep their powers um, into the break so that you can stick around and, and continue to, to chat in the, um, 
in the boxy thing. So, um, so let's stop there. Um, stick around. Uh, do uh, follow the comments. Follow the the Q and A. Uh, we now have a, a fifteen minute break. So, um, once you're uh, done with the chatting discussion, go get a coffee, and um, we will see you back here at fifteen minutes past the hour. Thank you. Really great work, and I will see you all tomorrow. But come back for the next session. Bye.